welcome to the Daft Souls podcast, episode number 25. Today I'm joined by Mr. Chris Bratt. Hello. And Miss Kezan McDonald. Hello. How are you both doing? Very well. I did forget to mention, actually. Oh, Bratt, sorry. No, no, carry on. Sorry, sorry. I was just going to tell you how well he was, but yeah, if you don't care, fine. Uh, like, feel oh, free on, to tell me I'm doing well. really badly now. Thanks. Oh. You, you've upset me, man. I, I, Please continue with your podcasting. No, tell me how you are. I'm good. I'm right now. Oh, no, really? I'm, I'm feeling nice. Nice and happy. Good. I'm glad to hear that. I just remembered mid-thought that uh, we did a live show last week. Um, I forgot to mention in the live show that we did actually this whole podcast, including everybody on it, and that includes you as well, Chris, because you're now an official member, Hooray. whether you want to be or not, just because you've been on it so often, it's even ridiculous <laughs> not to. Um, the podcast won an award. It's a piece of Perspex, it's pink, and it's says best podcast. So um, excellent. That's nice. It's yeah. kind of meaningless, but uh, it may mean that if you... If you like this podcast and you find yourself sitting at home thinking, am I insane to like this podcast? <laughs> Is there something wrong with me? Then apparently not. Apparently it's... it's At least some other people mm-hmm. like this podcast. Yeah, it's uh, it's probably now you should start disliking it because it's... It's maybe too mainstream, maybe? A bit too mainstream. Possibly. Yeah, I think so. Um, I think so. I liked it better popular. before that award. Mm, yeah. It was better before it got popular. Now it's, it's just weak. Yeah. Anyway, um, what have you guys been playing this week? I haven't been playing this, but it's made me incredibly happy. Uh, the Zelda 3DS remake of Majora's Mask. Ooh, yeah, when that right. was announced last night, I was on a genuine like chemical high for, <laughs> for several hours. That's just a coincidence. Unassisted. <laughs> 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 Provoked only by the news that Zelda Majora's Mask was, was coming back. It was brilliant. I followed, fantastic news. Yeah, I followed Nintendo Direct just uh, through people talking about it on Twitter last night. I uh, couldn't catch the stream. And yeah, that was those were the two words that people I just saw like everywhere. Majora's Mask. Very. I think it almost didn't uh, sink in till this morning because I was like, oh, that's cool. And I was like, no, that's amazing that's yeah. very cool it's such a, I mean I think the strange thing about Majora's Mask is Nintendo haven't been very enthusiastic about re-releasing it because it was in Nintendo's eyes a mistake because it was released very very quickly after working of time it was kind of rushed it was Eiji Aonuma's I believe first Zelda the first as director he'd worked mm. on Ocarina of Time and loads of Zeldas before and I think it was a very experimental very quick it's a rush job basically and so I think in Nintendo's eyes because it was slightly janky and it was a little bit less mechanically perfect than most Nintendo games are. In their eyes, it was like a bit of a failure. But obviously, in the eyes of Zelda fans, it's the saddest, most kind of profound, most meaningful, most remem- like memorable Zelda game that there is. And so I think it, there's this massive disconnect. And I think Nintendo's actually listened finally. After years and years, they've kind of gone, oh, okay, maybe it wasn't such a massive misstep. Maybe people loved it for interesting reasons. And you know what? Maybe they are actually as part of this. Because I remember with the 3DS version of Ocarina of Time, they definitely they sharpened they up a lot, a lot of, of stuff. Mm. I'm really wondering, because the only real problem I had with Majora's Mask was it was some areas of the game were really ugly. Um, because it did feel like, especially in terms of the uh, like landscaping and architecture and stuff, they very much just chucked it together. Um, because it was a bigger game as well. It was like you had a much, it was way bigger, yeah, much bigger world map, much bigger areas. But some areas you kind of looked at and were like, "This is ugly." <laughs> um, so I, did, I think I'm quite excited because if they could actually manage to make it quite a pretty game, then I think it's, my it's, word. It's first. I ended up writing a thing about Majora's Mask today about like why it still matters and why it still anyone should care about it. And I ended up going back and, and remembering and watching and, and finding a lot of stuff about it. And there's this thing, there's this horrible ghost story about Majora's Mask. Have you heard? Oh of it? yeah, yeah, the spooky. The Ben story. Or it's about a. Uh, it's about like basically a guy finds a cart and there's a save game on the cart that just says Ben. I feel like we just slipped into like one of those obscure subreddits where it's like no it seriously. Is, it's a creepy pasta yeah. subreddit. It's, it's from yeah. it's from Arno Sleep, I think. Back <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cool. Back in about two thousand seven or something. But it's the best ghost that story. Was <laughs> but it's, it's the best ghost story I've heard relating to video games, and it comes with creepy video. It's got creepy text. It's really good. Look it up. It's really great. Yeah. But it's partly enabled by the fact that Z- that Majora's Mask looks so weird. Yeah. It's so surreal, and the angular N sixty four graphics are so horrible, and everything it's, about it, it is, is it's, it's, it's unsettling. It's, it's unsettling. It's eerie. The idea that like there might be some weird glitchy stuff in the game, which almost feels haunted and broken, kind of makes it sense fits. in that it game. It totally fits, and also like the whole game is is basically based on a horrible occurrence at the start yeah so a, a lonely boy who's lost everything including his only friend gets abused by <laughs> a skull man who steals his identity and turns him into a hideous disfigured creature it's the most horrible bleak it starts to any yeah. nintendo game because uh, you find game. yourself just then going what the i remember that the first time i played it and i was like what the fuck yeah. like what I, now but the, i mean the end of ocarina of time uh, there was a fantastic edge article about majora's mask in 04 which was written by margaret robertson 
who was the editor of it at the time. It's online. It's really good. And uh, she kind of pointed out that the end of Ocarina of Time was super bleak. Like, he saved the world, everybody was celebrating, he was celebrating with all his friends, and then Link gets put back to a time before any of that happened. Nobody knows what he did. His Navi friend, fairy friend, flies out of the window in the, in the Temple of Time, and he's alone completely. And Majora's Mask starts at that completely bleak moment when he has nothing left, and he's he's got the weight of experience of a man, but he's a child again. And he's, he's, he's walking through a forest looking for his only friend, which is Navi, the only person who knows what he's been through, which is Navi, person, fairy, and doesn't find her. And then I watched the opening sequence of Majora's Mask this morning and he's he's on opponent and he's like hunched and downcast and his face is like staring at the floor and uh, then he, Skull Kid kind of captures him and f gets him from opponent and then he kind of wakes up in this weird place and Skull Kid's like, there's no use riding a thing like that. What is with that stupid horse? I got rid of it. And it's like, oh my God, <laughs> you killed his pony. <laughs> It was oh, maybe, just maybe amazing. She, maybe, maybe she I, 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 this is crazy. I know so little about this game. I, I think it's only like, maybe in like past podcasts when you've talked about like the the weird aspects of the it. Looping. But man, yeah, yeah that's the um, thing is, it's a game that has a lot to it, but also like mechanically in terms of how the the game works, in terms of how the dungeon works, in terms of how the world works, and the time thing. I can't remember a lot of it. I've forgotten a lot of it, and that's why I'm kind of looking forward to playing it in because with uh, Ocarina of Time, I remembered it all quite photographically. Mm. Um, because it is, in many ways, a much more perfect, well-rounded product. Whereas Majora's Mask is weird and kind of, at times, felt like, yeah, I say, very non-Nintendo. But it's often described, uh, I've described it as well, as being like Groundhog Day. Mm. But I realised today when I was thinking about it, it isn't. Because the crucial thing with Groundhog Day is the fact that it's the same day over and over again. And the only person who knows that is Bill Murray. But the day itself is completely ordinary. There's nothing... Weird about the day. There's nothing bad about it. It's sure, quite boring. Here you know something's. Where it's like the weird thing is, is you have these three day cycles then. where the world is going to end, and watching again and again as people go from being like, uh, it's just watching people being incredibly self absorbed right up until the end. Yeah, and and the the incredible everyday sadness of the people in that world. Like there's there's um there's that Goron. No, was it, there's that guy in the. He's not Goron. He's in the desert, and he's like, it's him and his daughter, and he's doing weird research into the supernatural because he's convinced he's onto something. And his daughter's worried about him, and on the third day, he just turns into this hideous, disfigured monster. Yeah. And it's like, oh shit! And obviously, the the classic, the classic is um, Kefe and Andrew. The, yeah, the, the love, love story. story. Yeah, I mean that's that's a classic tragic. But there's a lot of everyday sadness in. It is, and it's something really sad about the fact that with many of these, they're all side quests, and when you finish them, you get a mask. And the idea is that basically to get the true ending, you need to, or to get like the cool calling, you need to get all of the masks in the game. So mm -hmm. You have to do all the side quests, which is a really smart idea. But it means that like you go out of your way to try and make these people happy because they're so work. sad it doesn't always work the end the, the end result of you trying to help these people isn't always good or even when it does it's temporary right if you see them being yeah. happy and then and then it, the time resets and they're just playing back to being oh miserable God, again which is what he was game. thinking at the start of the game oh, man. what an incredible yeah. game it is <laughs> honestly I spent a lot of time this morning just reading a bunch of stuff to refresh myself on it but um but it's just one, funny, of the, yeah, one, of the, yeah. one of the insights I, I came across this morning like that kind of arrived in my brain was that moment at the end of Ocarina of Time where he gets all that time stolen from him you know, and he, he wakes up and he's an adult and he's lost 10 years. In um, in Majora's Mask, he gets that time back, but it's an endless succession of three days. It's like all that time that he lost by being sealed away in some dimension for 10 years, he gets back, but in a horrible way. And someone in the comments on the article I wrote about it pointed out that it's a way for him to atone for all the relationships that he lost in Ocarina of Time to try and make these new relationships in Majora's and help these people out and get to know them. But then again, it just resets every time. Yeah, so it's, it's so bleak. <laughs> It is, and I don't know. It's just it's interesting how, like, with games, I don't know. <clears throat> a lot of the time, it's interesting how kind of the main story, really, of, of you know, of uh, Majora's Mask, you know, stop the moon. The moon's gonna crash into <laughs> stop the. Stop the moon. Stop the moon. <laughs> that sounds like a warrior <laughs> wear flash. <that> becomes... <laughs> it's a pretty decent objective, to be fair. If but it, it's just interesting how the main kind of theme of the game is like not really talked about much. It's not like part of the plot. There's nothing ham-fisted about it. It's just something that gradually seeps into it's your there, head. There, yes. And you just notice, like. And the way that you're just sort of, you realise it doesn't matter. Like things like money quickly don't matter because you realise you can just basically like put money in the bank and it's all just like, you can just cheat all the systems, but just watching people being so obsessed with their flippant, stupid with problems. Their, three days. Right up until life. the last five minutes when the moon, when they all realise that they're going to die. And at that point, they all realise 
nothing matters, but then they're back to being like self-obsessed idiots going, people say the moon's going to crash into the earth. That's Lol. ridiculous. Yeah. That will never happen. But you've seen what happens to them in those final moments of vulnerability. Yeah. And it gives you real insight when you go back and see them. Oh, it's just incredible. What a game. How old were you guys when you played it originally? And did you um, kind of catch on with some of those no, themes? No, I didn't get, I I didn't say, get like, half of it. I was 12. I was a fairly sensitive 12 year old. Mm. Um, and I kind of got death and stuff time so I, I kind of it affected me very deeply but when I went back to I went back to it when I was 22 and um, I expected it to be to have been totally exaggerated in my mind by nostalgia and naivety yeah. basically because I thought it was so profound when I was 12 you know and I went back and I was like it's not going to be profound it's going to be it's going to be just a Zelda game really and no it's actually cleverer and darker <laughs> Mm. than I thought it was when I was younger. I mean, it's a real yeah, I didn't, grown-up I mean, Zelda game. That's the thing, is I didn't really appreciate fully why it was stuff. It just did interesting things. Like It's very anti-video game in many ways. That's, that's cool, though, because I guess if with this remake, there are going to be people that will experience that, I guess, going back yeah. to it thinking, oh, just it's just going to be a Zelda just game. Just the way it would right? undo, I'd, I'd up. It would undo oh, what you've done. Like, that's such it a, would, yeah, and that's like, really anti the law of games to undo yeah, what you've you done. You saved that person. You've made their life better. Now every time you walk past the bakers, the baker will say, oh, you're a hero. <laughs> <laughs> you go out your way to do something and then you'd be left with this token to show that you had done it. But you couldn't prove it but to you, anybody. But it would never be done again. Like, you it imagine, would be reversed. You imagine little mute Link running around trying to tell people about <laughs> what he's done. Mask. Yeah, <laughs> pointing at the mask. And also, I mean, that's the same in Ocarina of Time, like saying to people, you know, in, an, in 10 years in the future, I saved the world, but you guys will never know. Mm. Also, it had Tingle in it, who was a fat yeah. little weirdo. Was that the original Tingle? I think it was. Was it the Tingle what's, appearance? What's a Tingle? Tingle is a weird character who's sort of become popular and has even had his own game. He's like, he's like a fat wino who dresses in a weird skin He wants to be a fairy. fairy. Suit. I'd play his game. What, what yeah, it awesome. is great. <laughs> Tingle's game rupee, is weird. rupee yeah. ma- magic land or something. But it's he was a weird character. To be honest, Majora's Mask is full of really weird yeah. characters. So surreal. Um, like, yeah, I'm looking forward to playing it again a lot. I think I'm, I'm glad to see that Nintendo has started to embrace it a little bit. Especially because I've, I've said this before in many podcasts, but it kind of annoys me that as much as I appreciate why Nintendo are so perfectionistic and so wanting to completely have control of their own franchises and make every version really, really perfect, there is something really nice about what happens when they kind of get a bit fast and loose with it. And with Zelda particularly, obviously they did that with Capcom when they let them Capcom make three Zelda games on handhelds. And they weren't perfect, and they clearly weren't as good. Like they those were really games, interesting. They, but they were really interesting, and mm. I don't know. I just thought that I think sometimes letting other people play around with your formulas like that, even if the games they make don't become classics, I think it's a it's an interesting idea. Yeah, that's I, cool. I wish they'd embrace it a bit more. And I know you've you've tried in the past to to get me into the Zelda games, and I didn't grow up with them, and I I found it really difficult with Ocarina of Time to to go back. Without that, that is a of, difficult game to go back to. Yeah, I, I tried with my partner as well, and he was just like, "Well, the yeah." Was I, I ended I up feeling really like I was forcing it, and I, I wasn't having as much fun as I expected to have, and it, it kind of petered out because of that. Um, and I think part of that is because I kind of knew the formula, and I, and I found it a little bit. Um, I didn't get excited because I, I felt like I knew what was going on there. This one maybe. It's um, not like that at all. It, yeah. is, it is totally weird. It was completely I, left I, field. Right? I feel like there's a uh, a kind of parallel with. Um, people who read a lot of fantasy mm. but never read Lord of the Rings. Yeah. And they go back and read Lord of the Rings after reading lots of fantasy and they're like, yeah, and it's you've really played, generic like, and you've read so many things exactly, that are inspired yeah. by that. Yeah, that you think it feels formulaic yeah. when in fact it was like the literal. Sure, but I think, you know what, that's a really good way of describing yeah. how I felt. Yeah. yeah. But that, I think that applies to, you know, films and games and books. It, it was Lord of the Rings for me and I, I totally get why people don't quite get Zelda unless they were there the first time yeah. or some things. But the thing is, like, the new Zelda games are so good as well. I really feel like you could play Skyward Sword, having never played a previous Zelda. I really want to play Skyward Sword. It's on my list. It's good. It's my never-ending list. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's difficult to find time to play older stuff, though, when, when there's always new stuff coming out. So much new stuff. Speaking Down of which, video games getting released. Speaking of new stuff, time. I'll talk about this very briefly, actually, because um, by the time this podcast comes out, it will have been out for a while, and no one, literally no one who doesn't already <laughs> give a shit will give a shit. Uh, but I have been playing um, Call of Duty Advanced <laughs> War. Fair. Fair. Nice. Fighter. No, no warship. No, war. F- war. Fair. Fair. <laughs> Warfare. Uh, <laughs> it's all right. Um, I really didn't like it at first because I... I Single player or multiplayer are you talking about? Uh, both, the whole thing. Right. Um, I, I was playing it basically... Um, because Vice asked me if I wanted to write something about it, and I thought, actually, you know, because it was mainly I, the reason I kind of took it on as a commission, and interest, where it might be of interest, is the fact that I used to do it all the time. I used to be like, oh, you're a big cod, cod player. Well, yeah, well, obviously, I used to work for a PR agency. Uh, oh, of course, that yeah. Did PR for Call of Duty, so I was like quite involved with it for a while, 
And I loved it. I mean, Modern Warfare was fucking amazing. That was an amazing game. That was why, actually, when I was like, when I was starting to get the job doing it, I was like, mainly off the back of the love I had for that game, I thought this would be a cool job. And then it kind of gradually went downhill from that point <laughs> as a series. But uh, no, but then after that, obviously, after I'd had a cooling off period of like a good year, I think, after leaving that, when I was working at IXM before my editor at the time would let me anywhere near any of the products, which is, you know, for those of you who think there's, there's fucking no ethics in game, in game journalism, <laughs> you're wrong. People put a lot of thought into this stuff, they actually. Sure um, but then I, I started actually yeah, reviewing um, those Call of Duty games again. And yeah, it just ended up being because I was somebody who was actually interested in shooters and I had an understanding of the Call of Duty it's games. It's super hard to find people who have an understanding yeah, of Call of Duty it games, is. you know, because it's one of those games that's a bit all or nothing. Yeah. yeah, you have to have a, like fifty hours to spare to spare to really understand the multiplayer and stuff. And so, w- when you're looking for someone to write about COD, it's actually really hard. It is. Most most people who you know work in games are like, I don't have time for that. They become these really complex machines mm. of stuff. Like you know, it looks simple, but actually, like and the differences are so minuscule between. Yeah, the, but the, the but, balancing there it's yeah. minuscule but important. You know, these really important. Sure, these are games that people are going to spend hundreds of hours in. Exactly, until the next it, one feels, comes out. You it feels insulting to just be yeah, like, oh, yeah, I've not played one in a few years, but this one's alright. Well, that's, that's the good. problem. Is I basically. I didn't play Ghost last year mainly because I heard so many bad things about it that I skipped it. But Ghost is the first one in years that I haven't played quite a lot. Um, but it was just weird. I was like, I used to write the reviews just because what, when you become the guy who reviews them, it's just yeah. like, well, you do it again because you're the only person who knows yeah. whether this one's better than the last one. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it, even going into it was just like quite horrible again just because it's like, it expects, it's almost like they've doubled down on the fact that they're like, well, and I kind of get it. They're like, well... You know, people who think that Call of Duty is bollocks and they're like, oh, fucking Call of Duty is turgid, it's the same stuff every year. Those people are never going to play it. So it kind of feels like they're just purely focused now on people who are, like, fans. Yeah, I mean, I have a lot of sympathy for that because I get kind of angry when people say the same about Mario or Zelda. Oh, the same thing every year, it's just bullshit, it's always the same. Yeah. Which it isn't. So the fact that, you know, people say that about COD, you know, I'm, I'm inclined to think, well, maybe it isn't. I don't happen to know enough it, about it, it, it to know really, but maybe from the outside it looks like it, but that's not the case. It clearly is a bit different this year, quite a bit. It does feel different, like the handling in the multiplayer, does, it doesn't feel quite like Call of Duty, which is good. I mean, it's like, it's different. There's kind of a more weighty movement to things but also the, the speed of the game is still incredibly fast paced and you can do all of this kind of crazy movement dodging stuff that basically allows you to like almost like kind of fighting game style or like you know you can basically just dodge like you can yeah. just jet boost it can be satisfying I, when, when that happens as well like I've been watching uh, one of the guys at work play quite a bit of it and when, when you do have those moments where you manage to just dodge out maybe behind some cover in a way yeah. that you could never do in past Call of Duty games you can do mad stuff yeah. you can like yeah. jump in the air and then dodge backwards and jump over people's heads and stuff it's Especially in the air, it's it's literally like the way you'd handle it in like Devil May Cry or something. Mm. I mean, it's not as kind of profoundly <laughs> movement-wise, but it's it's quite cool. It's interesting. Halo 5 does the same thing. The, ah. the beta is out this week. Um, Teleporty, with, jumpy, dodgy stuff. Yeah, um, they so Spartans now in Halo 5 uh, in the multiplayer beta that they're releasing, which is the kind of arena mode, the more esports-y. Right you know, no fucking progressive unlock bullshit mode. Mm-hmm. Um, but they've given Spartans a jetpack that lets you kind of boost sideways out of the way. It lets you extend jumps, Titanfall style. It lets you, uh, you know, there's a couple of special moves you can do with it. Basically just, you know, if you're getting shot at something, it's like, Phew! and you can kind of jump and move backwards, you can go sideways, and it just gives this kind of level of manoeuvrability and, and, and immediacy to it's it. It's cool it's to really see stuff fun. coming up into the air now, like, I think, mm. in terms of like, yeah, having games yeah. being a bit more kind of, Making use of the arenas and stuff, it's getting yeah, yeah. more like old school shooters. That's right. Like the, the new Halo, the new um, Halo 5's beta also has this clamber mechanic where basically you can climb on anything that any ledge at all. You can kind of climb up onto it with a button. So uh, instead of kind of moving around on one plane, you know, when you're getting shot at, you can boost out of the way, jump up, clamber, run. And start thinking about things in proper like three dimensions, and you can end up reappearing behind the person who was shooting at you. That seems to be the big shift in, in like the the big mainstream shooters at the moment, doesn't it? Like the the verticality of yeah, that's it, right? Of yeah. the map design, it seems to be the the thing that stands out the most to me. But like, it's just one of these things where like I played like maybe two or three missions of the main campaign, and then thought this is fucking bobbins, so I'm going to go onto the multiplayer, and then it just immediately it's just like, hey, you're in a bucket full of screwdrivers. Like I just didn't have a clue what was mm. going on, and it's just like. 
Yeah, just trying to get your head around it because it's like I missed one year of Call of Duty and suddenly it's like, <laughs> yeah. what the fuck? No one waited around. It's like it's like in Harry Potter or something where it's like he misses one Quidditch lesson and next week like there's all this crazy shit going on. <laughs> there's new rules. How's he going to stay on his broomstick? Yeah, <laughs> it is. It is weird. That. Like, oh, it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't stay on my broomstick. I got I got just so dicked on on multiplayer for a while. I mean, I, it was probably didn't help that I was playing against the Jeremy Carl crew who just they know what they're doing. Um, but yeah, it, it, I did. I did start to stick, and it was like, actually, no, this is quite good. After initial frustration of being like, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what I'm doing. The story is terrible, though. The campaign mm. is. It's like, it's sort of dumb because what they've done with the um, with the multiplayer has made it a bit more kind of like a bit faster and a bit more. Well, that's what the whole the whole game, like the whole franchise, has, has evolved into that now. This fast-paced, movement-based thing, and yet the core of what the single-player games is still very much like traditional Call of Duty of being like for a cover shooter, of being yeah. like hide behind the cover, pop up, shoot the people, right. push forward slowly. So it's just completely. It's at odds, isn't it? Yeah, it's a campaign that gives you all these amazing sci-fi toys. And it allows you to do this jump stuff. People are always telling you to jump. It's like, I'm not fucking jumping around. I'm going to get shot. Um, <laughs> It's actually, actually quite an interesting thing with that that change, though, because that's something you have to get your head around in multiplayer, from from what I've seen. Because jumping up in the air and getting uh, you know uh, getting up to high levels, it, you you float for a little while. Like it, it makes yeah. you very very vulnerable. Yeah, yeah, same with Halo Five actually. Um, so yeah. it, like, although it looks like a thing that you'd be using all the time, you've got to be quite. Also, it makes you appear on clever. radar. And again, yes, of course, anything to do with the boost, right? Really annoys me that they just don't tell you any of this stuff. Like, oh, my computer's making noises. I'll stop that. How dare it! Go oh, back to sleep, you stupid <laughs> man. Now, um, it's just annoying. It's like, I don't know, there's there's something about it that when you just jump into it, it's kind of like, I think maybe that they've got a bit blinkered with how they make the games now and they expect people who are buying, you know, a new Call of Duty and who are playing it to have, like, maybe spent months watching, like, all of the dev yeah, videos it's and the previews. Yeah, I mean, and... the thing is, like, I grew up in the time of Arena Multiplayer when multiplayer shooters, you arrived, you didn't have better guns than anybody else, but you had no guns, probably, all that was separating you from everybody else was your knowledge of the map yeah. and your knowledge of where stuff spawned, if anything did spawn. And it was very much, like, so accessible. Mm -hmm. It was very skill-based, but also really accessible. Like, you could just play it with anybody. But like, here's a map, you got a gun, shoot other people with it. Yeah. Whereas, I remember my first Halo 4 match, this is what put me off Halo in the end. My first Halo 4 match, everybody apart from me had a fucking jetpack. Yeah. I was like, what the hell is this? How come yeah. everybody else has a jetpack? <laughs> what is this, this bullshit? bullshit? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't have 30 fucking hours to unlock a goddamn jetpack. Oh, no, yeah. No. That turned me off the, the Halo multiplayer completely. Like, I, I adored Halo 3, um, the, the multiplayer side of it. I spent so much time in that. And yeah, the, the kind of Switch, I, it, was, it was, once again, it was kind of a, a thing that was going across all the shooters at that time. The Switch yeah. kind of classes Progressive and unlocking unlocked. things as you go. And Where was, was my that fucking was, battle rifle? That's not Halo, is it? Where was my goddamn battle well, rifle? Well, it's, it's the rich getting richer, and that's the, the big problem with the whole Call of Duty setup as well, and the fact that even the whole way the kill streaks work of being like, you know, hey, like, I mean, I, I've been, I'm getting better at it now, but I'm still just finding myself being like, oh, cool, I'm, I'm just getting, uh, ooh, look at all these exciting things I'm being killed with. I don't know what they are. <laughs> Yeah. and I'll never get to try them myself <laughs> yes. it does seem like they moved away from the kind of kill streak rolling though like uh, you know you, you unlock one thing that kills people from the air which unlocks your next kill streak yeah. before you have to even yeah the, the, you can just kind of chain them they yeah. have and also one of the things I do like is sometimes if somebody gets a big kill streak then it pops up being like it's almost like this guy's a jackass yeah, <laughs> no 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 it's almost like uh, it's really condescending but I love it and the way it's like oh I need, he needs they need support for this and it's like basically the first person to hold down the square button or whatever for like two seconds will be like a support gunner in the chopper or whatever so they, basically it means that if somebody on your you team get go. <laughs> yeah, nice. you get a little go on the little oh, gun oh so that's adorable it's the only time I've got to do it I was going to say I bet that's you isn't it it's like, it's like come oh, on man let me let me can I have a gun in the helicopter pay me, pay me, can I have a gun <laughs> <laughs> But I really appreciate that as a gesture because I was playing it thinking, oh man, not this is. It's like I enjoy it when I get good at it, but I think, oh, I hate this. This period of being crap at it, not knowing the maps, you know, I feel having no fun. I feel like that stuff at the risk of sounding ancient. It's a teenager's game. Yeah, like I, was, I, I was going yeah. back to. Um, I was playing a lot of Halo Master Chief Collection this week, and I went back to the first two Halos. Um, and I'm a kind of lapsed Halo player. Like I, I played Halo One for about a year and a half every day Halo 2 I hated I just didn't like it at the time because it wasn't the same mm. different and I was yeah I was, I was I don't know 15 and I was like this is bullshit it's not the same and uh, Halo 3 I skipped and Halo 4 I played again 
So I was going back to Taylor 1 and 2 and I was like, I've played this game a million times, I'll stick it, I'll stick it on. Taylor 3 is good, it's better than 2. Is it? Yeah. yeah, yeah I'm, I'm looking forward I, to rediscovering it on Master Chief Collection. But um, the first Taylor I stuck it on Heroic. I was like, yeah, I've played this game a hundred times, it'll be fine. I sucked. <laughs> yeah. I was so bad at it. And I was like, God, did I used to... Uh, am I bad at it or is the game really hard? And they have this awful thing in Master Chief Collection where they have a little par time for doing the level. <laughs> it's like, par time, 20 minutes. Hour and a half. <laughs> nice. And um, it was it really was shocking because I was like, have my skills just degenerated massively? And the difference was, I think when I was 13, 14, and I was playing that, failure motivated me. I was like, oh, I've died. Never mind. Let's try again. Whereas now I'm like, oh, I've died. What a waste of my time. And I think that really does change slightly. As, it definitely, as you, that's as the thing. It's, just, it's the, the pace of, of uh, New Call of Duty and the, the assortment of stuff. And just it just the fact that it expects you almost to, to either be somebody who's just like, I think I think partially it's that they expect you to have been a fan who's excited because they That's put right, all the yeah. information out in advance. Mm. So you turn up and you're already like you know all the grenade types, you know about all these things. And I'm just like, as somebody for the first time playing with the little button on the grenade that changes the letters. Because I'm not really in the game industry as much anymore. I haven't been to a preview event for mm. this game. I haven't seen it. I haven't had a, somebody from like Sledgehammer talk me through the new grenade. So just jumping into it as a straight up consumer, putting the disc in the tray, my immediate response is, what the fuck is going on in this game? Yeah. Um, but it is clearly quite good and it actually really does some stuff that they're quietly is actually like quite cool like the way you get random drops you get a little random drop box which has guns in it and like the guns you can get like it's a loot system basically of being like hey you got a green gun oh it's better you got a blue gun or you got an epic gun and it's Ooh. basically literally like the green, Fuck. blue, purple, orange yep. It's going to be in everything, isn't it? It's, it is. It's going to be. But it's kind of cute because it means mm. that like they're the same as your normal guns, but it'll be like, oh, this one's got slightly more power. Oh, this one's got slightly this more range than that. But <laughs> I just, this is what I don't like, though. I want everybody to have the same no, 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 weapons. I just want all of them to be the same. Yeah, I just I want to understand what I'm picking up. Like In every shooter I try and play now, it's like I have to spend three hours looking at the wiki before I understand what fucking gun I've got. That's why Destiny I like, pissed me off with well, that. Like, I, I like Destiny because it was so simple. It's like, well, yeah, you've I mean, got it felt your guns. Good. It's like, here is your gun, is your gun nice? Y slash N. But then it had all the levels and all the kind of meters. Like, when you're trying to pick, and when you have three level, I don't know, 19 guns, and you're trying to pick which one to use. I oh, get, I, I get, just use the one that feels right. Yeah. I mean, I get <laughs> obsessed with the little, the little graphs. Yeah. I'm like, well, I like this one best, but this one has a better graph, so should I be using that one? It well, just it, feels like there is an objective best one that I never have. That's the thing. I mean, <laughs> there, there will be that within this. There will be like certain guns that will be more powerful, but it's just nice the way that it's not like this is just better. It's like it's trade offs. It was like this one's got more range, but more recoil or whatever. And they're all a bit randomized, but you can also, you can like crunch them down for XP. So basically, oh, if you get some same, stuff same in your box destiny. that you don't want, you can be like, oh, I'll have some more XP and then level up. That's and, crazy. I never thought I'd see that. Come into Call of Duty. And you can tell, like, actually, I was talking to, I won't say who it is, but I was talking to somebody today, and they were like, yeah, you can tell that they're basically like, because somebody somewhere is going to be watching the data for this very carefully and going, can we charge people for these boxes? These oh, boxes of loot? Yes. Like, and it's like, yeah, they're blatantly thinking about it, because it's like a really elegant system that also feels a lot like loads of other systems that like EA have used in lots of their games with it. It's very much like FIFA Ultimate Team. You can see, right. like, you can see where they're thinking of going. You know, I don't have a problem with that because in a way, like, clearly for me, what Advanced Warfare shows is it's like they're really doubling down on the community and just making good games. And it's a really good Call of Duty game from what I can tell. I mean, as I say, the campaign is fucking shite, but they've all been shite for ages, <laughs> so you just get used to This that. one's shite, but it's got Kevin Spacey in there. Kevin right? Spacey so that, that, that carries it. We, to did, we did He's a, good, we did a yeah. review of Kevin Spacey. We, we decided to leave our Call of Duty review for a few days, so on Monday we just did a review of Kevin Spacey. I missed that, that's lovely. <laughs> that's pretty good. Uh, it's yeah, pretty yeah he's brilliant, all. Kevin uh, Spacey. Well, what was, what was the rating? He, you get like oh, you got a yes. Yes, okay. You should play scale. Kevin Spacey. Is yes, that? you should definitely play <laughs> Kevin Spacey. But right. it depended on which type of Kevin Spacey you got. There was like angry Kevin Spacey, right. sad Kevin Spacey, <laughs> etc. It was good. I oh, spoilers! I haven't got to angry Kevin Spacey yet. I'm <laughs> yeah, sure that's I will. near nearer the end. Angry Kevin I'm Spacey. I'm sure I will. I got a feeling he's a bad guy, mainly because it's patently fucking obvious. <laughs> I said, I said that, and got I, people were like, dude, oh, that's that's a spoiler. It's don't, so obvious. Don't the entire plot. I didn't play the game. I just could write on the map. Also, has anybody seen House of Cards? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. But um, oh, I was going to say it's to do with the fact that um, uh, no, what I was going to say is it's, it's one of the weird things about Call of Duty is people are so disposed already to one way or another. Like, and mm. a weird effect I saw, and I didn't do it for this reason. It wasn't like me being bloody Milgram or something. Isn't it? <laughs> um, I put up a really weird video today, which was me just doing a weird like blast train of thought nonsense 
video about me like just looking at the few people at the funeral on the second level and just commenting on like how sad they looked and whether it was like HD 60 frames per second grief. And it was like, it was like a weird mishmash of ideas of like, I wanted to sort of partly take the fat, piss out of the fact that they'd made everything else in the game look amazing, but then these people were still kind of crap NPCs. And I partly wanted to take the piss out of YouTubers just blurting out this 60 frames per second nonsense mm. at 100 rates of knots. And it was like, it wasn't anything. It was a really weird video. I go as far as to say it was a shit video. Um, in fact, it didn't really have any, even have any jokes. But it was just a weird thing that I blurted out and had finished making in five minutes and just thought, well, I'll upload it. But what's fascinating is the reaction to it has been incredibly polar. Everybody presumes that they know what the video is about. And that's just, they can't, because I don't really <laughs> know great. what it's about. No, no. <laughs> like, <laughs> even I don't really know what the intention of it was. But half the people have gone, this is great, taking the piss out of Call of Duty. Whereas the other half of people have gone, hey, this is mean. Like, I can't believe you've been so harsh on taking the piss out of Call of Duty. And it's like, it's just, it's yeah. funny how everybody has just immediately twisted it to either being like, this is you taking the piss out of a game, that's mean, you shouldn't, they've, they've done, it's pretty good. And other people have gone, yeah. Fuck Call of Duty. Yeah, so I found it refreshing that people like this year have started to say, yeah, that's, you know, this one's pretty good. Like, it's nice to just see people talk like that about Call of Duty just because for years it seems that there has been that kind of immediate hate that, or immediate kind yeah, of... Yeah, shit, mate. People have already, yeah. already made the decision well before they played it. This this year does feel a little bit different. I feel that is kind of an ignorant thing to do sometimes. I mean, oh, definitely. Often, actually. I mean, especially with... Uh, because I know how much it annoys me when it's a series that I happen to know yeah. intimately. And it's like, well, I would never presume to say that about a game. Like, Call of Duty is a game that I have played. I've played, like, four of them. But I don't say I know them at all. Like, compared to people who play the multiplayer properly and stuff, I don't know them at all. Yeah. It's funny, now. It doesn't matter what they do. They could make the best shooter in the world. Mm. It could make... It could have been... Like, Advanced Warfare... Warfare blah, 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 blah. Advanced whatever it is. <laughs> could be... But it's not, like, the best Call of Duty game ever by any margin, but it's mm -hmm. a return to form. But it could be. It could be, like... All the reviews could be like, this is this is amazing. This is the best Call of Duty game. And wouldn't make a difference. Wouldn't make a difference. There'd still be a huge amount of people who go, I wonder if it even I wonder if like <laughs> in that example as well, I wonder how, like if that even affects sales like with, with Call of Duty, because people have made that decision so far in well, advance. Like, interestingly, the sales tend to reflect on the one after. So oh, right, okay. Ghost didn't sell amazingly. Well, by Call of Duty standards, yeah. it's all it's all amazing. But it didn't sell amazing by Call of Duty standards because people weren't very happy. with And because of that, I feel like people were surprised one. that this one was coming out. Like, yeah, they, they, it just kind of it was Blops two before Ghosts, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. People weren't happy with Blops two, so they didn't buy Ghosts. And I think it's interesting because bec perhaps because people who bought Ghosts weren't happy with it, they won't buy Advanced Warfare. It's, it tends to be a year later that you feel the effects of that. It's like, what, what, what was that really bad? Was Modern Warfare three not particularly good? Was that the one that's? Uh, that, that was all right. I mean, there's, there's, they, there's one of them that's like. Maybe Coblops 2. The thing is, they, they divide different people for different reasons. Like, uh, Coblops 2 had a terrible campaign. Like, laughably bad. It was often comically shit. And actually, the same is true in Advanced Warfare. There's a bit where basically he has you playing Frogger at one point, where you have your it's guy next to you going, Get over the road, Mackenzie! Cross the road! And he keeps saying, like, Cross the road! Cross the road, Mackenzie, like way too often. And it's like this fucking insanely busy motorway with people firing guns at you from the other side of it. And he just keeps going, cross the road, cross the road. And you're like, yeah, all right, mate. Come on. I'll cross the road in a minute. It's quite busy. After I've shot all of these dudes. Because you know what? I'm not going to run past like a fucking crazy motorway while I've got eight men on the other. And I kept going, well, maybe something will happen. So a few times I did actually just do, I did what he told me and I crossed the road. Sure enough, you cross the road and you get a shot to shit by people. Yeah, that is weird. It's like that's not very good game design. It's really bad, and the problem is you end up then getting fixated and realizing that all the cars and buses on the road look really crap, and the way they move just isn't right. They don't look like cars, and it's like, maybe that's why then they're like cross the road, stop yeah. looking at things, come on, come, come on, on. Move, yeah. on. Move, on. <laughs> move on, move on, for God's sake. Oh, uh, but um, uh, yeah, it's it's good, but well, like I say, it's one of those things where it's interesting because it, people are losing interest in the series, even people who love it. But everything has its time. Mm. Do you give a fuck about FPS? Um, I kind of thought I didn't until I started playing Destiny. Yeah, um, but it's, then it's I still realised I do like it. I only have cared when developers have made a huge song and dance about it being 60 FPS or whatever. Like with Halo, it looks great. It's great. It's it's great. It is great. But sometimes it starts a little tiny, tiny bit. And in any other game, I'd be like, yeah, whatever. But in this game, because they've been so fucking boring about it being 60 FPS, I'm like, ah. Oh, Dipped. That was a frame rate dip right there. <laughs> Normally, I just wouldn't wouldn't give the slightest. You stupid toss. chicken dippers. <laughs> 
That's what I call, that's what I call people, developers who make games that dip below six frames a second. Yep. You're all stupid chicken dippers. Nice. Good. Honestly, though, I want to get some t-shirt printed, t-shirts. I'd love the idea of having t-shirts that say, I couldn't give a shit about 60 frames per second. It's weird, though, because you, you assume, basically, whenever, whenever we publish anything on Kotaku about frames per second, all the comments are like, oh, who cares? Massive traffic. Oh, yeah, people, people love really it. People really care. Traffic mm. does, but the thing is, Developers are spot on when they say it doesn't affect sales because no, like, I'm sure it doesn't. It just sales. doesn't. They're like they go out of the way. Developers have gone maybe out of the way. Maybe on PC it affects sales. Yeah, like for, like for some Crisis sorts sold of games. just by being pretty, didn't it? Yeah, but I mean that's just that's just Crisis. It's yeah. like the kind of it. They they are wasting their time by making Crisis a game. It could just be a series of of jungle. You want to change your graphics card? All right, it's basically like, do you want to see how pretty things can be? Like doing all that stuff with a plot and aliens, waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody gives a fuck. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It just seems like people can go out of the way to be like six frames per second. It's the same way with DRM. You know, you've had loads of people who got bitten by the whole "we've made a DRM-free game" and then it goes out into the wild and just dies. It's like people make a big fuss about some things, but actually, it's not the be-all and end-all. Yeah, um, it just isn't. True. Anyway, Brett, can you tell us about a game which people are going to care about next week? Sure. I've been my last week, almost two weeks, has just been dedicated to various parts of the Dragon Age series. So I've been. Uh, Replaying Origins. What uh, kind of a job is that? That's know, ridiculous. And, and what is your job? You get paid to yeah, play videos. Video yeah. Have that as well. opinions about them. Listen, Jesus. Right, okay. Ridiculous. Guys, please. Um, <laughs> so I'm just playing your mind. I've been replaying Origins in my own time. Kes McDonald. Uh, <laughs> on the weekends. Um, you know, and, and just because it's a really good game. But also to try and just get back in that mind frame of remembering. Like you, you talked about um, with Majora's Mask, you've had to kind of revisit it. And, and check and yourself before you wreck yourself. Exactly, and like, uh, there's, I think uh, the the keep stuff. Uh, you've been messing around with Dragon Age Keep. I have. Um, kind of rebuilding about your your world, your 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 save file because um, it remembers the decisions apparently as you start Inquisition at the kind of Bioware formula. And I remember but, that apparently there was like loads of stuff in Dragon Age One that I don't remember. Like I remember some bits. I was like, oh yeah, I remember that really well. But then the problem was I had is I remember the scenarios, but I couldn't remember how things went. Yeah, and I, it was I, like, I was exactly strange. Same. What you remember? I kept being, being like, like games. Oh no, yeah, I, I definitely saved their lives. Yeah, no, I definitely. Yeah, did they die? No, I, I wouldn't have <laughs> let them die, would I? It doesn't sound like something I would have done. <laughs> it, it's interesting, right? Because the the Dragon Age Keep is is impressive the way it presents all of those decisions, and it reminds you that fuck Dragon Age, you know, let you mess around with a lot of stuff particularly Origins yeah. and it presents it in this lovely tapestry and, and you can kind of replay your story with uh, the voice actor of Varric like kind of talking you through it lovely however when you import your um, your save files into that you're not actually importing your save files it's basing those decisions on your achievements um, that you acquired for Dragon Age Origins and 2 so a bunch of the stuff in Keep isn't actually right, and you have to double check pretty much everything, other than the the big decisions. So like, say um, with the in, in Origins, I'm sure this is when you probably like. So hang on, you say it's based on the achievements, not Largely, those yeah. things. Yeah, it's really? not. It doesn't. So it won't remember your what your character looks like in Origins. Or, oh no, I'm not expecting things like that. But it, it was. It's largely um, comes from yeah trophies and achievements. Because I because I played it on on PC. Mm -hmm. I played the first Dragon Age on PC, but I played it through Steam, I think, and therefore I didn't have my game linked through Origins, and I don't know how... I don't, so I, how what if it, it could Yeah, I mean, I might have the save file cached on Steam somewhere, yeah. but do I have to reinstall Well, that's the thing, it, with Inquisition, or? you don't bring in a save file, it's done through Keep. Um, gotcha, but... So, I, I think that's, you know, it has something to do with the fact that a lot of people played it on consoles, and accessing that save file is difficult. But I'm just confused with the, the what you're talking about with the, like, achievements and trophies. And so, so, I think... Um, the with say when you meet the Dalish in Origins, mm -hmm. um, there's you have a decision whether there's some kind of internal feud going on between the da Dalish elves and uh, some werewolves, uh, something you have to kind of yeah. Everybody you, remembers that, right? Yeah, werewolves. See, that's one of the big decisions. Um, I know. But the, <laughs> I, I whispered that Dragon Age, right away, really did have an issue with Dragon Age being really, really. Generic. It is. It's incredibly generic. So is Mass Effect in the same light. Oh it, yeah. It's, oh, yeah, it's yeah. you know, it's big ancient evil coming. You're a hero in this world, and you need to unite the races to stop them. That's the story in in both games to an extent. It was but generic. The but actual, it was great. The way it handles. I think I was reading Game of Thrones at the same time as the original Dragon Age came out, and I was like, Ah, mm. yeah, that might have yeah, put kinda, a damper on it. Kind of killed it for me. But I, I, love, I love Mass Effect and Skyrim and a bunch I just of other like fantasy, just not Dragon Age for some reason. I should go back to it, really. Should Dragon I? Age was really good. Mm -hmm. I liked the things I liked about Dragon Age was the fact that it let you do 
all sorts of things. It was one of those good RPGs when, when you fa- th- found yourself thinking, can I do that? In terms yeah. of like, how could you resolve a situation? Yeah. Not in terms of like, can I climb on this barrel? Yeah, sure. uh, it often would let you do Big it. Big questions. And it, uh, it often presented those those moments where, like, I, I like to when I when I play RPGs, I, I like to have a real clear idea of what my character is, how they would react to certain situations. And it's horrible when you can't do that. When when you you have to you come across a situation where you just have to do the good thing, even though you're playing maybe a character that that is very self absorbed or whatever. And it, it's really disappointing when you're taken out of that. I felt like Origins always offered a bunch of different decisions and let you really kind of play that kind of character. And also it kind of touched upon what um, The Walking Dead did so well years later of having it being less about the decisions you made, even though obviously unlike um, The Walking Dead, the decisions you made in Dragon Age did actually have an impact on the game. Mm -hmm. But it was more to do with the fact that you you become quite attached to your followers and they often would have something to say about that. They they, often be quite like, what are you doing? And then you'd have to either be like, oh no, I'm sorry, we won't do that. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> or you have to then, because th- there were situations where you'd end up having to fight and kill them yep. if they really didn't. I mean, wow. if you go through Dragon Age, it's like real life, you know. Yeah, yeah. you disagree. I often fight and kill with my friends. Yeah, absolutely. I've not got any friends left now. Mm. It's a shame that it, looking through the the options in in that keep situation, um, it shows that like you can end the game with a bunch of your party killed, in- including mm. um, Liliana, who was the the kind of she was involved in the chantry and she was. From Orlay, and that. I never really hung around with her that much like in her. Origins. I didn't, but she became a bigger character as the series went on, and she's in Inquisition. Um, she's like kind of the spy master role. However, she could have died in Origins. Can I tell you something weird? You romanced her. I didn't, no. You um, her her. I got really annoyed with the way that the romance options in that game, it was like, it was quite open in some regards, but then I got really annoyed by the fact that basically, it was clearly when you meet Liliana, she's just like, clearly, she's just sort of quiet, like, oh, Oh, I'm just, I'm just a quiet young. Mm. Oh, the librarian uh, trope. Yeah, and yeah. it's like, oh, she's shy. She's nice. Go on, give her a kiss. <laughs> well, she'll probably like I'm it. I'm glad you didn't kill her because she become she has become a much more interesting character. Yeah, she, but she, then you've got you've got her right, and mm-hmm. you're supposed to. She's supposed to be basically, and it's really horrible in video game, but she's supposed to be the easy romance option. Like, do you want to romance a lady? You're not fussed particularly about who it is. Ta da! And then you had Morrigan, who was like, ah. Oh, She's like hard, oh, impossible. Like, how do you do? She hates everything about you, everything you stand for. You'll have to give her hundreds of spell yeah, books. Bit trope. <laughs> yeah, that's it. And it's basically like, oh, yeah, but then I you give can... you enough presents, he will love me. Yeah, you just win her over. Like... Okay, so I, I need to say once again, I think Origins is incredible. The way it handles conversations in that game is really interesting. The romance stuff was really immature. Like, when you get to the end of that game, this is a spoiler for Dragon Age Origins. Um, but you you're approaching the, the final boss fight. It's a dragon. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. It's a dragon. It's a dragon. All right. Um, but it's, it's actually an archdemon leading the blight. It's it's slightly more interesting. And um, you're given the option to, if if one of the characters has sex with Morrigan and she becomes pregnant, it will stop the next blight from happening, which is this kind of the thing you've been fighting the whole game. So and it will save your life as well. Yeah, but it's yeah. Like, hey, how do you like? And you've the been idea told for a while that you're going to die. Not dying and. Getting your wick wet. It feels like that that part was written by Wait, a, a thirteen year old. I'm very confused. So that happens, well, Morrigan yeah. was the witch who's played by what's her face from Farscape, right? Yes, that's right. I've had enough of it to know that. So you have to get her pregnant to save the world. You don't have to. That's your decision. She, she offers it you. As so a that's deal. A, is that the only way to save the world? No, no, no. Okay, you, okay you, all right. It's, so it's not like you literally have to have. No, sex. no, no. Okay. It's just it just right. the thing is when it's presented to you, it does, strange. it does seem like a good deal. And also, yeah. it, there is a kind of overarching thing about it. Will apparently stop the next blight from happening from what I remember so it's like it, it just feels impregnate like impregnate me for great justice exactly and but it, she's also she's a bad lady so you sort of think what are you going to do yeah. with this baby and that's you that's what that's bad. actually what we've been waiting to find out since the end of Origins yeah and absolutely two didn't mention that at all because I, I remember I went along with it just because I thought where's that going to go because yeah. like, clearly clearly she doesn't care about you she just wants a child and you sort of think they sold the DLC you, for Origins on the very on the back of that, being like, "Do you want to know just a little bit more about what might be going on there? Go and play the Witch Hunt DLC." And you kind of you see her again and have a very brief conversation at the end of the DLC with her. And that, like, yeah, okay, that stuff was immature. But it's an interesting um, kind of situation to put the world in. But that's not what's weird. What's weird is I fancied the old lady. I can't remember what her name Win. was. Win. Yeah. Because what they'd done in that traditional video game way is they were like, "Oh, 
she's an old lady, and yet they'd still made her quite pretty, yeah. but with some wrinkles at the edge of her mm-hmm. face and with the body of like you know a twenty year old. I think they all, they, they all had pretty much the same. <laughs> they all had the same body. body. Yeah. And so it's this thing of like you've either got like cold hard witch bitch or like sappy librarian blushy muck blusher, or you've got this like. Perfectly Quite sensible cool, woman person, yeah. who's just like smart, knows what she's doing, doesn't oh, yeah. talk about. And I was just like, I fancy her. She's the one. And I you was... couldn't because she was an old woman. Ah, oh, you can. <laughs> that's you can be that's as funny. Bisexual as you want, but no old people. Mm. I was always amazed by uh, the Harvest Moon games romance options. I was, oh, a, God, I was yeah. a very, very hardcore Harvest Moon fan for most of for most of my life. I stopped. I stopped after Harvest Moon DS because it was shit and I just thought I've played this game 40 times. Yeah, they times. did get really bad, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, it's like I'm going to... Tale of Two Towns is apparently really good but I, I just thought, you know what, I've played Harvest Moon now many, many times and it's always the same and I think I can probably not ever again. The Game Boy Colour one was amazing. Dude. Um, oh no, the Game Boy Advance one, Friends of Mineral Town, that's the ultimate Harvest Moon. Is it? It's super, super good but the options for romance because usually you had four options and it was Librarian Girl, Kick-Ass Girl, um weird one who wasn't actually that weird but was weird enough to count as the weird one and like you know the other one would just be so sort of bland pretty one there was always four like yeah. basically the anime girl archetypes you get yeah I was about to say that that sounds familiar yeah and um, there was always the uncomfortably young one that was always yeah. one of the options mm-hmm. uh, but Harvest Moon Friends of Mineral Town had I think 12 or 15 options for the boy and for the girl for romance and it was it suddenly uh, you know because I find myself always being like there's no way I'm going for librarian there's obviously no way I'm going for the uh, the the kind of moe moe oh senpai one I'm never going for that so <laughs> I ended up going for this one called Karen who was basically an alcoholic <laughs> Jesus <laughs> and we've all been works, there she works at a bar and she's the daughter of the family that owns the bar and there's this really dark scene randomly halfway through the kind of romance thing for that where she's just like drunk off her ass and like passed out in the street and you have to take her home to her father and her father's like yes yeah, this is in a harvest moon she game. does this and like gives you a bottle of wine as a thank you and I was like wow Karen <laughs> it's pretty impressive wow Yes. Was it, have we talked about this on the podcast before I, maybe Quinn's mentioned it but I, I always find it stunning that the fact that there was a maybe well, you Quinn's and I have similar taste in women so it's quite yeah. possible <laughs> <laughs> with, the, um, with the fact that there was Harvest Moon for girls yes that uh, was on uh, that was on the GameCube they specifically made Harvest Moon for girls was it the GameCube they made the and fr- they've made it so what basically was it, called? it was just called Harvest Moon for girls Is that, was, or Harvest was, Moon for girl I think for girls yeah, this yeah, may be a repeat anecdote from the podcast but I can't remember basically it's exactly the same I game but when you, game married, when you get married when you get married the game ends yeah that's it fuck that's the, the game that's the worst thing <laughs> it's like oh, oh, you've got a husband now he can sort out the rest of the game that's it was, I can't remember if that was it's the game the one or the, no no it's, it's a miracle life for a girl was the one on the GameCube, but I never finished it as a girl, so I don't know. So yeah, things have got a lot better. Things have got better than they used to be. Japan. I don't think we'd ever do the the Morrigan situation the same way now. I think I think that was of its time to an extent. Like I I think I'm not sure um, Inquisition is doing anything too bold there, but I don't think they do. End of the game. You need to get me pregnant. And it will make well, it easier I for you. Well, actually, I think was I don't think I really used to think about it until I think I was having a conversation with Martin Robinson of Eurogamer now years ago, and he just up until that point, I just always loved Bioware games and I always loved Mass Effect, and mm-hmm. he just after quite a few drinks just went, "Oh, fucking Bioware!" Like with their cold, clinical, weird relationship-based yeah. games. And from that point onwards, I sort of like I started to try and look at it from that perspective, and realised, yeah, it is. They have very, very strange. Mm-hmm. Like in terms of how you build relationships, not just sexual, but friendships with yeah, people. Yeah, I mean, Origins, you, there, there's, really a, there's a gift system involved. That like, um, that you, you know, you, to improve your relationship with people, you give them like things that you think they like. And yeah, I mean, I've often do I've overused the phrase, yeah. but it's sort of very much sort of choose your own sex adventure sometimes mm. with these things. And but the whole like the, the, inclusivity of being like, hey, you can have sex with anybody you want was a bit. A bit weird. It's funny. Like, the, I love the the game the game system of uh, sex tokens. So you, you put in enough tokens you, know, yeah. you, you bring somebody a fresh egg every day in Harvest Moon or you give them presents in literally any game you give them presents and eventually if you give them enough presents <coughs> you get sex back out of the vending machine yeah. and it's like but it's, it is it's weird the kind of, it? it's, it's sort of like nice guy logic like, it is, it I'm is just nice really logic. nice to you and at the same time and I'm really dishonest about my feelings for many 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 years eventually we will have sex it's like nah not sure that's really doing much for the uh, at the same time can you imagine how frustrating it would be and that's the thing is that's bad but can you imagine how frustrating it would be if you had a game that had relationships in it and you could get into relationships but it was just like real life in the fact that sometimes there might be somebody you really like 
and they're just never going to like you. Yeah. And that's it. And there's nothing you can do about and, it. Yeah. They're never going to. I would play that. I would play the heck out of that. But I think it's different when you've, well, yeah, when you've in in the Dragon in the Bioware games, you've created your own character, right? And it it, it is very much fantasy fulfillment. It is, and I think so. Um, I played the the Walking Dead season two this year. Really, really liked. I don't think it got uh, the kind of love it deserved. And I found it really interesting that game. The dialogue options. To me, kind of spoke to uh, as to what Clementine was thinking. Like she kind of had the, the had thoughts that would race through her head telling. before she answered. And whereas in Dragon Age, because or or Mass Effect, because of the way it handles that stuff, one of those options is always, "I'd like to fuck you now, please." <laughs> like, and, <laughs> Sorry. And, and and it's it's weird. Imagine because if you, that was just life. Yeah. <laughs> I suppose generally there is that thought I guess, somewhere. I in guess your mind. so. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. It's usually the thing is that's usually an unspoken thought. Yes. That's sent with the eyes. And <laughs> eyes are something that games haven't yet managed. It's not a dialogue Oculus option with a little heart <laughs> next to it. Oculus Rift. You control the game entirely with your eye gestures. That's when we know we'll have made it when you're playing a game and just by the way that a character moves their <laughs> eyes, you immediately just know that they want to have sex with you. And you just that's that's when we'll have made it. We're not there yet. We're not. We're not we're even quite, anywhere. We're quite, some, we're quite, <laughs> we're we're quite far away from that. Anyway. Way, that was an incredibly off topic thing yeah. please tell us about Dragon Age 3 yeah well it's not Dragon Age 3 is it? They, they removed the number which I think says maybe something about what they thought about Dragon Age 2 I don't know um, it's so we're recording this after the review will have gone live right? yeah don't worry yeah, it's yeah. all fine but I've only played like 15 hours at this stage okay so it's not these are not Chris Bratz up to date. No, these are facts for Chris Bratz up to date thoughts. You can go to videogamer.com nice. and there we read this review. Probably. Is it going to be re- written and video or yeah, something? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, I, think, I think I have to justify it, right? If I've spent that long with the game, I'll have to. Personally, I'll to watch the video because yeah. reading, who can Boring. be fucked? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was not a true laugh. That was a. Yeah. It's it's <laughs> that, was, that was the the laugh of my career just it's died. It wasn't a true a statement. Dive. I'm still right. If yeah. I believe that, I'd be an idiot. So with yeah with uh, with Inquisition, I mean I'm enjoying playing it, and I'm enjoying it for very different reasons to why I liked Origins. I think I'm I'm really struggling to get past that because I I hold that in such high regard. It and we with Dragon Age two. Um, well, we were talking about this before, actually. It reviewed really, really well. Like, it, it, I think on uh, if you look at the Metacritic for that, one. Yeah. it's on. It's in like around the eighty number, um, I, which you wouldn't necessarily think when you when you hear how people talk about the game years on. Like, it, it's very much seen as the the lesser of the two. They do talk about it as if it killed their relatives. Yeah. Oh, definitely, without a doubt. Um, and yeah, so I'm I'm kind of in a similar position where I'm enjoying playing it, and I I think it is a good game. It's just not what I would call a good Dragon Age game. And that uh, has largely come down to the way it handles the stuff outside of the, the main storyline. And there is so much stuff outside the main storyline. It's apparently, if you complete all the side stuff, you're looking at somewhere approaching 200 hours uh, with that game. So, and yeah, I, I don't know how long the, the, the main storyline is, but you if you look at past but games... But you said to me earlier, you said that it's almost a bit Skyrim-y in terms of when you get to the areas, there are these massive areas with yeah. stuff to do. The areas are gigantic. My main concern with this would be of like looking, when you're looking at like maybe 200 hours and a lot of it is through going around exploring mm-hmm. doing stuff. I'd say the vast majority of it is that. Would you not get to a point where you're just like, oh, it's just the same shit again? I've I've got to that point, I think. Um, <laughs> oh dear, is, that doesn't bode well. Which is, yeah, I, it's... I don't know. Because I, I gave up on Skyrim after I I put about 30 hours in and I looked at the world map and realised I hadn't even seen like more than a quarter of it. And I just thought, I don't want to do this again. It depends what you are, because I think plenty of people would say the complete opposite and say no, they loved yeah, totally. Skyrim for that reason. And I think that's exactly what people are going to say about this. Um, but when I look at why I um, I get all excited about Origins, even though I look at things like the romance and think, oh, maybe that, that could have been... Oh, yeah, I, mean, it's, I, I fucking love sure. Origins. It's a, a fantastic and, game. I, you know, it's, just, it's a kind of one of those internal conflict things. I remember sitting there and doing it. I remember mm. sitting there and giving people hundreds of gifts, thinking, there's something about this that is deeply creepy. And yet, as a gamer, and as a fucking somebody having a fantasy experience, I yeah. want to do this. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not criticising the game. In a way, it's like a weird joint criticism of how games treat relationships, but also like how willingly our brains are yeah. to just lap that shit up. Oh, definitely. Some, somebody on Twitter today was like, I wish I could get a procedurally generated relationship. That was Paul Dean. Yeah, oh, it was Paul Dean. I was like, all relationships are procedurally generated, dude. You've you got to use the skills you learned on the last playthrough <laughs> to deal with the randomly generated events. That's, like, that's actually entirely... That is relationships. That's entirely true, yeah. yeah. <laughs> They're all procedurally generated. You don't know what to expect going in. It's like Spelunky. The first time you do it, you'll fuck it up. Exactly. You just get slowly, slowly less shit Second at it. Second time, until... death by spikes. <laughs> 
rough time. Totem poison. Yeah, I know, right? We've all had some bad times. Uh, yeah. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, that's not what Johnny May teaches you, though. You just pick which other romance option you like. So, so I've been, I've been hearing so. right, Inquisition. Mm-hmm. That is genuinely fucking great. Right. I've been I, hearing a little bit of that from people. Yeah, and I think I think it. I, I say I am enjoying playing it. It's just the the, the thing that I'm I'm kind of held up on is that the way it treats these side quests and there is so much of that. That's a huge part of the game, and you can just get lost in that stuff because you constantly feel like you're progressing and it's, it does all that kind of lizard brain stuff and it's brilliant. But when I look back at Origins and the reason I like the side missions and that the stuff going on outside of the storyline is because I felt like I had a lot of impact not just that i was fulfilling their needs the people i came across but i was making decisions along the way so you know um like i could be the good guy or the bad guy um to put it basically i had at least those two options to go down here i'm seeing very very little of that like the first village you get to pretty much sets up how that game's going to treat side missions and it's you you kind of liberate the village you go in and there's there's the npcs you can't talk to other than the merchant which you can buy stuff off, and the ones that will give you quests. And the ones that will give you quests, you walk up to them, they'll say, right, we need 10 ram meat, which is... Do you kill 10 rams? Felt immediately like World of Warcraft, right? The, the kind of, yes, I did. And I gave him the meat, and he said thank you, and that was the only interaction I had with him. I actually know I could ask him, why do you need the 10 ram meat? And he's like, everyone's really hungry. <laughs> like, <laughs> Mate, have you never eaten before? And had to make a meat dress. And that was... <laughs> have you seen Lady Gaga from the other realm? I want to be like her. <laughs> that would have been great. And yeah, so like, like that, was, that was all I had to do with that side quest. And that is all I had to do with any of the side quests. A lot of them, actually, you miss the first even hurdle there. You don't have a person to talk to. You'll find a letter in a hut that will say... Uh, I, well, I listen, want to make a meat dress. If anyone's reading this, we could really do with ten rami. It won't be ten rami. It'll be we could really do with you retrieving this family heirloom. Have you got any um, orc teeth? You get it. You pick up the letter. You you press M to look at your map, and it has a little dot on the map where the ring is. You don't. There's like you rarely have to think about it. You rarely have to oh, talk to about that, it. Though? And like that will be that. I enjoy doing that stuff to an extent because you know sure. it's you know it's a game I get to progress and everything I do my characters getting better they're getting stronger they're getting new gear it's it's great but the reason I love Origin so much and put it on that pedestal is because it handled that stuff differently. But it was the narrative detail, wasn't it? It was mm. as the setting and the world were quite cliche, but it it went to a degree of detail exactly. with the story. Yeah, that's what separated um, it, I think, because without it, it is stop the dragon from destroying. And the actually, world. it's weird how like in a way like. Mass Effect and Dragon Age, obviously the first Dragon Age Origins, Mass Effect, and actually it felt like almost in a weird way, like quite similar to both Mass Effect One and Mass Effect Two in terms of the structure of the game mm-hmm. and the fact that Mass Effect One dabbled with it. Do you remember when you landed on the planet and there was this, like everyone was a bit weird? Mm. Why is everyone acting a bit weird? And then it turned out it's because there was a bloody psychic plant thing. Yeah, that fucking was good. with everyone's head. That was great. That yeah, was a good. The thing was, it was like then it kind of felt like to me that they realised that that was kind of a highlight of the first Mass Effect. And with Mass Effect 2, they made it a bit more like that. So it felt like every mission in Mass Effect 2 was like an episode of Star Trek. It could go anywhere, yeah. It could go anywhere. It was like, you turn up somewhere. It was that real feeling, yeah. What's going on? Yeah, yeah. And it'd be like, there'd either be an obvious problem that you might have to resolve in a weird way, or there might be just some weird intrigue. And it felt like every bit was self-contained. The same thing happened in Dragon Age. You turn up. Remember there's one bit with the possessed kid. That was Redcliffe, yeah. Yeah, and it's just like, you turn up somewhere... You think you know what you're doing, and then they're all kind of quite self-contained stories. Classic that, open world quest design. But honestly, that, the way Bethesda, Bethesda used to be quite good at that. I don't know if they're so good at it now. Not lately. I'm, I'm hopeful yeah. they'll they'll get their shit together. Mm. The way they handled that Redcliffe situation was interesting, though, because within that you had loads of different ways to do it. If you look back at, at yeah. that keep stuff, you can see the kind of decisions yeah, they made, including yeah. like one of the options was you could slit the throat of the kid and um, like. That was an okay thing, and like that, that would progress your storyline because it got rid of the possessed kid and solved the political situation there. Like there, were, there was some really weird stuff that you could I do. I didn't realize how many options I didn't, there were until I didn't going through the keep. Them. Yeah, and same. then you go to the keep, and it's like oh, some wow. people did that. I, like, I, I like went above and beyond to make sure that everyone was happy when I left. Letting that dude out of the cage at the start of the game, yeah, like a tiny thing. There was like four or five ways that could have been resolved. This is another thing, right, with Inquisition. I. We're going back through through the keep and looking at all those decisions, I've had to spend quite a lot of time on Wikipedia and replaying the game just to get the context for those decisions because I couldn't remember yeah, and I wasn't vague. wasn't convinced that it had got it right because of the way it handles uh, how it how it looks at your past games. And so far, what fifteen hours in, I've seen very little of 
any impacts there, even though I, you know, just just days before playing it, it yeah. I made sure that everything was set up fine. And I kind of knew this was coming, but I hoped that it wouldn't, because fortunately games that let you make a lot of decisions then have a sequel, a lot of them don't get that right. Um, I think Mass Effect, Mass Effect did it better than what I've seen so far, because it had those kind of cameo moments where characters yeah, and passengers would turn Yeah, for me it felt like Mass Effect 3, pretty much all it it was a did was the cameo stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But, and, and that is, that oh, is actually, disappointing in its own that's right. That's not true, because if you did things right in the earlier games, you could like have a situation with hey, I'm not spoilers it was, but still, anyway. it was still basic stuff though right like they, yeah it was it was still disappointing and, and you get why like if you think about the kind of work that would have to go into creating a game that could account for all that stuff of course oh this is why The Walking Dead works so well it's like do you do this or this this or this this or this this or this mm. same general outcome a little bit of variation makes everybody feel like they've done something you know there's their story but you get to put all of your the, focus on one narrative flow exactly yeah. 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 so you don't have to try and account for 50 different variations you, yeah. you account for one vari- you, account for, you account for one outcome but many variations which I think Really That's cool. why it's strong. It yeah, that's why it's really good narratively. Yeah, you can't actually have a story that accounts for the player. Not being unless you've got like tons of money. But yeah. you do sort of. I, I knew that tons going into it, but I did sort of expect to see. Like so far, I all I've seen right is uh, Liliana, the character we mentioned before, could have died at the end of Dragon Age Origins. Apparently, depending on what you did, um, she's the spy master in in your Inquisition. So she's a pretty major character, not a party member, but you speak to her a lot. So uh, presumably, if she died, she'd have to be replaced with someone. And outside of that, I've had a couple moments where I've spoken to Varric, a key character from Dragon Age 2, and I'd be like, so uh, what's going on with Hawk's companions? You were Hawk in, in that game. And he'd, be, and he'd rattle through it, he'd be like, so this one's doing this, one, this one's doing this. That one died, and this one's doing that. That's, that's all you get. Whereas when you think about that world, that doesn't make any sense because some of those characters, if a giant um, kind of, like a tear happened in the, the sky and demons started falling out of it those characters would be involved because they're they were the heroes of that world they'd be there be like guys do you want some help right and i haven't seen any of that yet even so much as in origins you pick the king of one of the the biggest regions for elden um you you can decide who's on the throne the king or queen actually because you, you it's not necessarily alistair um and i haven't seen him yet whereas in my mind thinking about the political situation i'm creating inqu- an inquisition in this world i'm kind of taking control ignoring governments and this key character that, who's on the throne, I put him on the throne, hasn't even turned up and gone like, so guys, what's going on here? I'm sure he will. I know that will happen. Yeah. But the little details, the, the stuff that I've worried about... Well, I mean, one of the things you mentioned in your preview video was the fact that like, you, you chose a race which is of like a weird race that are yeah. often like, outcasts, and the fact that you are leading the Inquisition and nobody even like raises an eyelid. Yeah, so I, I, no one even goes, hang on a minute, why are we... Or following this guy, and particularly being tensions, a major within that race is yeah. something really special as well. Like that, sh- that you never, you've never encountered a character. No one has encountered a character like that that's free willed. Um, so not seeing a reaction to that was was strange. And like there is a good game underneath that, but I've come in with so many expectations. Yeah, and that's on me. Like I find well, out. No, yes and no. I mean, especially I thought one of the things, for, for considering how generic Dragon Age Origins was in many regards, I thought one of the things they handled really well was the way they actually did deal with racial tensions and stuff mm. a lot that was what yeah because games are kind of nervous about ever dealing with race even when it's fantasy fantasy race. yeah I remember yeah. when you got to the bits where like you know you'd be Morrowind like, was good at that too with the elves and stuff and it'd be like you'd be like what the fuck are you doing to all the elves and they'd be like oh well, they're elves fuck yeah, them shit. They, like, they, call them, they call them <laughs> knife ears which is like yeah. a, a, a derogatory term in that world when in Origins you decide who's going to be the, the king of the dwarves right it's, I know it's generic and fantasy and weather but your choices are between an old fashioned guy that's actually you know seems pretty legit and um, he seems like a good person except for the fact that his mentality towards the world is old fashioned and he won't he doesn't want the dwarves integrating with the people that live on the surface or you can pick the really shitty guy the guy that if you did one of the origin stories you know he's a backstabber and he's politically minded and he's, he's killed people to get where he is but he's progressive so you've got a decision there. Oh, that's, that's harsh, man. That's yeah. a difficult decision. You want the old, with, racist, yeah. reliable that's dwarf? brilliant, yes. isn't it? <laughs> or the one who's maybe going to be more useful for you because he'll send his armies out onto the surface yeah. to help. Or just, or, just, yeah. or like a hundred years from now, maybe my decision will have helped this race. Like that is... To integrate, yeah. That's amazing. And I haven't had any of that. And because I... I, I keep having to say this. I think it's a good game, but I'm, I'm so well, swayed so by the rest about, of it. Because the thing is, I couldn't really get a sense for, for watching the, the video um, in terms of the B-roll they've released of the game so far. Mm-hmm. Uh, the combat looks like quite fun, yep, yep, yep. and I, g- I guess in my mind it feels a bit like maybe a cross between Skyrim and maybe an Assassin's Creed, and the fact that you have to wipe out all the enemies in an area, and then the area is 
you own that by the Inquisition. Mm-hmm. Does it have that kind of addictive thing of being like slowly unlocking this yeah, map? Totally. And, and every every time you clear an area, right. you place yeah. down your your kind of flag that has the Inquisition on, and it does a, a kind of a, Boom. and yeah, a noise that, that's like yes, you've just done something impressive. I know the noises. And the Inquisition as as a whole is now stronger because of what you've done, and that's that's great. And it basically, it, it kind of has a resource system where everything you do in the game unlocks power, which is something that when you go back to your headquarters and you look at your kind of war table, you get to make all these decisions that you don't have to personally go and do because it's a four uh, four character party game like a lot of RPGs. Um, but you've also, you're in control of this army, you are an Inquisitor. And so you can spend this power saying, right, I'm going to send soldiers here to help this political situation. And you don't necessarily have to go there and fight yourself, but you've, you know, moved chess pieces on the board to to change the world and, and, and kind of benefit your your whole role in this as a result. That's great. Like, I love that. Um, it's just... Yeah, I wish there was more of that in the game outside of those moments because it it's all tied around... Like, there, there are good conversations in the game. There is great dialogue between the characters, as there always is in Bioware games. Um, but it all seems it's to be centred around yeah. that story bit. You, you'll, you'll go out and you'll do your uh, four hours of messing around this zone and unlocking stuff and killing things and putting flags down and getting a noise. And then you'll go back and have your 15 minutes of character progression. Um, and it, it becomes very obvious. Uh, they, Bioware games have always done this, but you'll kind of have a, uh, a system where characters will hold back information. They won't, won't want to talk about something from their past until you get to a certain point in the game. Until they like you. Exactly. But it's, it's completely... Who wants another biscuit? Right. And they'll, they'll, they'll reveal something else, but it's all tied to your progression in the then game. And then they'll fuck you. That's, that is generally the end result. Um, and it makes it much more obvious here because you are doing... You, you, you're going out and doing this stuff that has very little story going on and then you go back and you get your bit of story and you go back out again and do your, your side quests and things and, and kill things and put flags down. And yeah, it's yeah. I think I'll go back to what I said before. It's I'm enjoying it. It seems like a good game. I don't think for my the way I think about it, it's not a good Dragon Age game. For the full verdict on Dragon Age, or, <laughs> not Origins at all, Inquisition. Inquisition head over to videogamer.com. There we are. Oh man, Inquisition. No, I, I don't. I was really interested because like you know. I think I'm going to be. I, I think it will review well and across the board though. I think I'm going to be. A little bit different well, there. Maybe which you'll be is, one over. You never know. I don't know. We'll see. Hope, yeah, hopefully that is. You may, be, you may have a turning point. I mean, I, was, I, was, I remember one of the things I liked about Mass Effect 2 was just suddenly it was like just when you felt like you were getting. Just when you felt in Mass Effect 2 like you were getting a feel for the game and you thought, oh, okay, I, I see how this is going. I see how this is going to pan out. Mm. And you just start to feel comfortable and thinking, okay, this is pretty good. I'm enjoying it. And then just went, boom, curveball. And yeah, just like, yeah. The whole game just sort of changed a little bit, and that was the point where it was like, <gasps> yeah. And suddenly I, I just got unbelievably excited. Um, out what of a game that was! Yeah, it's cracking. Mm. So good, so good. Mm-hmm. And I do, I do wonder if if the backlash and stuff, and not not necessarily the complaints that people had, because um, I do think some of the complaints, particularly about Mass Effect Three, you know, I don't agree with them, but I think that I can see why they're fair. But not the complaints themselves, but the actual backlash and just some, look, looking at some of the shit that Bioware have had to deal with over the past three or four years. I do, I do well, worry stop about being so oh, good, Bioware. I do worry about yeah. talent drain with that stuff. I don't know. Just, oh, it must be so dispiriting. It yeah. must be. And I've been to their offices, right? They they have an office in the middle of fucking nowhere in the ice and snow. It's like so their only interaction with people is is that. Yeah, like, <laughs> you know, it's it's kind of like it's not not bleak, but it's it's kind of yeah. I mean, the area of Canada they live in is is pretty like. A pretty bleak area, and you kind of think that their studio is lovely, great atmosphere. But I can't imagine what it must have been like to like have you sort of feeling isolated in the snow mm. somewhere with an office of people that are all a bit glum because they feel like they're just being dicked on from every angle. I can't imagine that would have done much for the, uh, the, the mental well being. Yeah, it's a shame. But um, anyway, let's go and have a couple of questions. So, first up, we've got a question uh, relating to the live podcast from last week. Uh, what is the dog game called? And dog Park. Like, dog Park. Dog Park. That's an easy question. It's not out yet, though. Well, answer. It's not out yet. No, yeah. it's one of those sort of indie games in progress. In fact, the dogs keep turning upside down randomly at the moment. So yeah. It's probably it, a good it, idea to wait a bit. Yeah, you want to wait until the dogs aren't <laughs> flipping <laughs> out. They're, they're Literally right flipping out. <laughs> dogs are flipping all over the show. What is this? <laughs> what is this Dog Park? Um, second up question. What, what we got. Um, do you have a game you like to play when hung over? He says, this is from Luke Summerhays, and he says, for him, it's Dynasty Warriors, which I can see Ooh, that. Yeah. Monster Hunter for me. Yeah, I can imagine that's more to do with like, you knowing it. Well yeah, enough, I know right? it, and I know that what's happening, and I understand like all of the parameters, <laughs> and that nothing bad will happen, so it's fine. 
I, the way you, that sentence was incredible because that is exactly the sort of that sentence that people Don't would worry. say when hungover. Yeah. They'd be like, I know what's happening. I know everything's going to happen. And it's okay. I'm in control of this. <laughs> yeah. I just need a cup of tea. Yeah. And then, and then I'll be all right. I can't do anything I like too much when I'm hungover. Because I feel quite emotional. I can't do much. When I play games that I really like, like, for instance, Out of Wind Waker, which I'm still going... I've played, like, an hour of that a week since it came out. Um, but if I'm hungover, I don't want to play that because I want to really enjoy it and I don't feel like I can if I'm like... Ugh. Whereas Monster Hunter, because there's a lot of repetition, it's, like, soothing. Yeah. It's a good game to play for that. I used to play Persona 4 Golden a lot when hungover. Just do the dungeons. Yeah, I mean, that's a grind. Uh, gr- I think stuff with grind is grindy, nice for yeah. that. Like, I, I actually found uh, I'm kind of uh, f- falling out of love with the Destiny a little bit, mainly at the exact point when they the said <laughs> what the DLC was and how much it cost, at which point it felt like somebody just snapped in my brain and just gone, fuck you! <laughs> like, just being like, no, you're, you're going to be trying, you're going to be pulling this every two months. You're going to be like, give us £20 again until I decide not to, so... I don't know how I feel about it anymore, but that was good because it was just like, hey, I'm too hungover to do anything, but I can just go around collecting things or aimlessly shooting really easy enemies Such in the face. Such easy enemies. Like going back to Halo was like, wow, man. Yeah, it's tough again. Yeah, it's hard. Those enemies are so difficult to kill. Like I ran up to an elite in Halo 2 and smacked it in the face. I didn't even get the shields down. She smacked me back. I was immediately dead. <laughs> what the fuck is this? I melee you. You should be dead. Yeah. That's uh, how games work I'm, now in yeah. Halo 2. I'm the Master Chief. <laughs> This I'm is, this the is one outrageous. Punching people, mm. not you. <laughs> also, I'd forgotten how hard life used to be before grenade indicators. Yeah. The first two halos don't have grenade indicators. So you just right, kind of beep, and you're dead. It's like, what well, the? Where is? If you're lucky, you see it arcing through the air. If you're not lucky, it just kills you immediately. Man. Yeah. Fuck. I'm not ready for that. Yeah. Anything with repetition, really. I was going to say like Nuclear Throne, which is a game that I constantly play over and over again. I still want to play that. That's out now, isn't it? Uh, it's still early access. Oh, um, is it? Okay. Yeah. Though, although I. Yeah, it, it 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 feels like a a finished game that's getting updates rather than a game that's progressing to a state. Okay, being finished. cool. Because I mean, um, I, I've been waiting till it's done, whenever yeah. that is. But the, the, the repetition in that is the same way that people repeat Spelunky by the sounds of it. Um, it's like you you get better as you play. I don't think I could play that and go for it. That would be a terrible idea. It's there's, there's too much going on. Too I used to play Fantasy Star Online all the time, when it, just because I knew it so well. Guild Wars, just... these play. Hungover. Yeah, an MMO play, actually play, would be perfect. I play guess. CRPGs a lot whilst I'm over. Mm. Which is good. I, last game I played with a horrendous hangover was me playing uh, Dark Souls Two with a hangover, and that was that was hell. That doesn't. That can't know. That wouldn't be. Good and that was all. a really bad. Hangover Awful as things well. happen all the time. You don't know any of the parameters. And <laughs> I mean, I didn't enjoy that game as much as the first anyway. But I mean, that was just horrible. Probably didn't help. <laughs> Going through the Lost Bastille with a hangover was just like. Oh, oh no, that's not even no, a good area no, to no, do no, it, is no, it? No. <laughs> the only thing that that was the the only point in the game which I liked the fact that after eight respawns, the enemy stopped because I thought. Me playing this today is not an entire waste of time. Shit. Because <laughs> it meant I knew that it was like, well, I've died again, but I've killed you that, five times. That is <laughs> Only the. three more. Yeah. That <laughs> is the hungover up. mentality, though, isn't it? Like, me playing this today isn't a waste of time. It's pretty much. Yeah, that's it. Like, it's repetition and it's easy. Sometimes but it can be like so comforting, though. I mean, I've talked about this in the past, but Kingdoms of Amalur Reckoning, a game which, yeah. by all accounts, porridge. by anyone's reckoning, Gaming porridge. is kind of rubbish, but comforting, it's nice. It's really plan. comforting. Like, it's just sort of game you can play with a, a heavy cold or. I should uh, clarify, I am a Scot, so porridge is not a bad thing for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, it's not bad for thing. other people as well. It's just people are. People assume that by porridge you mean gruel. I like porridge. Porridge is great. It's underappreciated, you know. I always get weird looks from people when somebody goes, Who doesn't oh, appreciate porridge? I know how someone has porridge with salt on it. Just well, salt. Amer- and I'm like, Americans I have like, like oatmeal, that. which is just horrible, watery, oat, disgusting. It's like when I went to, the first time I ever went to America and I ordered oatmeal for my breakfast, I was appalled. So I think that's what people might be thinking of. Americans eat porridge. granola for breakfast and think that that's healthy. And it's just <laughs> like... Sugar it's just and not. carbs. It's like, it's hey, look, we've baked something in honey. <laughs> I'm under no <laughs> illusion there. I just eat it because it's mean, delicious. Yeah, don't get me wrong. Yeah. Granola's fucking awesome mm-hmm. but if somebody pretends that that's a healthy option that no. ain't no health no. food <laughs> it's not a health food and um, finally because we were already a bit over I uh, might as well answer this one um, because I can I kind of feel like a cheat with this because it, it's going out in a week so it's not a problem uh, somebody says ask Matt until he gives him what's going on in next week's Apprentice in painstaking detail well I'm not going to tell you in painstaking detail because it actually would have been on television yesterday shit I think but no if you haven't seen it yet though, I do have an appearance of some sort I don't know how long for um, in The Apprentice it's through board games and they've made a fucking terrible board game excellent um, well 
Man, it would have been I bad if they'd well. been a good one. Like, what do you do then? Well, not would you, just... How would you have got on television if you couldn't take the piss? Yeah, I mean, this is actually pretty good, guys. I don't know. Nice I mean, one. I guess if they'd actually made something really good, I would have been like, wow, this is pretty good. <laughs> for a bunch of apprentice pranks, you for were a, right. For a bunch of Helens, <laughs> you've job. done well. Um, nice. No, I mean, I, I might as well tell you what there was briefly, just because it might get cut so horrendously on TV that you don't get that idea anyway. But what they made was this game which was basically snakes and ladders, but it was like called like the love game or something. It was, like, <laughs> oh, no, it was supposed to be like no. a sexy party game. And the way it worked was that basically it meant that you'd roll a dice and then you'd move uh, like... No, you wouldn't even do that. No, so that's not true. You wouldn't roll a dice. It was like snakes and ladders, but you could go up or down depending on bullshit. But then the way you move was then you take a card someone else would take a question card mm-hmm. and they'd say oh. ask you a sexy question no it wasn't the thing oh, thank was, god it would basically say what do what do women like to do most and the answers would be either like go shopping oh, or B fuck. go for coffee with their friends or C go for a walk Kez, there was a woman could you help us out with this what so do you, you think Kez? Well, unilaterally all before. women like to shop well, and you have got to spend your husband's that's money that's the thing at some you point. would have probably been correct and you would have got three points for that because what it did is for <laughs> each, so for each <laughs> answer it had for each answer it had the correct answer and then the second best and then the one that was just wrong so you either got three points two points or one depending on how objectively right you were about something that objectively all women or all men liked it was that like is, what do men like Football or the gym, a pint or yeah, the gym. That was it. One of them God, was like how that, depressing. and it was like no. The correct answer was the gym, <laughs> and it was literally like as soon as I saw how because I read the rules for this game and I looked at the cards and as soon as I saw how the game worked, I just kind of flipped because it was like I was like trying to explain to them. I was like, look, guys, this is like nobody comes out of that. This well. isn't even sexist. It's just like it's, it's just offensive. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it's like it's not offensive to either women or men. It's just offensive everyone. to everyone. It's, offen- it's objectively <laughs> offensive. And then I was also saying like, look, if independently, you, if um, you if you made it all, I said all you'd have to do with this game is make it so that you, somebody holds up the card and then you say you have to guess which of mine yeah. is the best yeah, yeah. one. And then you've got a game. And then it's a game, sure. And you've got a game that's fun because Would people go, oh yeah. my God, you'd rather go to the pub and than even, the gym? That's even crazy. if the options weren't what you wanted, that I mean, would still be funny. Because it would still be lame, to, but it would at least it, have that human interaction. It would interaction be lame, but you'd learn something about people. It might be a sexy, fun party game, as it was. And that's why one of the things I said to them, which ended up being a soundbite for the next episode of The Apprentice, which is on on yesterday, so I'm getting weird with times because of when we're recording this, I said, if somebody brought... I said... I think I said, if somebody got this out at a party, I'd leave. <laughs> Which is true. I wouldn't like leave like flipping the table, but I think if somebody got that game out and said, hey, we'll play it, I'd like play it for about five minutes and then I'd. I had I'd a board game that used to make everyone leave my parties. I used to deploy it strategically. Oh man, really? What was yeah. it? Disney Trivial Pursuit. Oh god, yeah, I'd be out of there well yeah, fast. Yeah. It got all the men out really, really quickly. <laughs> and you'd end up with like four women who'd stay and then you'd have a nice time playing Disney Triple Pursuit. I got really good at bailing from parties when I was at university. I was terrible. We went to a few really awful house parties at which I just I just pretend to take phone calls, just step out of the room, step out the front door, and never come back. <laughs> I got, since I moved away from London, I've become fairly good at ghosting, which is just yeah, disappearing without ever saying yeah. goodbye. Because it's like you always have to be the first person to leave the pub when you got a train to get home. And everyone's like, no! I stay you can stay on my couch and it's also, like, like I yeah. don't want to I mean now, <laughs> I want to go home now like you kind of you get better at like not going to the sort of parties that you'll have to leave after five minutes because they're the exactly, worst yeah. parties in the world yes. you, you, as an adult you get better at making up excuses that mean you never have to be there mm. <laughs> which is brilliant I, very useful if you have children yeah of course I guess there is them for everything. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you've done them a disservice maybe there is a market for, for them in that very particular example you, you're hosting a party <laughs> And you need people to leave, but you don't want to be a dick about it. You want to be quite polite. Get this out. I don't so know if Disney Trivial Pursuit must still be in print. But, just clear. Uh, yeah, it was just baffling. It was like literally, I was just looking at it being like, how have you come up with this? Like, how? <laughs> Who are you? Who how are have you, you made? They were like, I, was like, I was trying to say to them, I was like, you were, you've, you were, you've been so close to making something that would have been quite fun. And instead you've made something that is just universally awful. awful. <laughs> and I was like, I was saying, I was trying to be positive. She was like, um... Because it was one of the orange ladies from the show, and she was like, "Yeah, but you know, but but what? Can you talk about what you like? Let's just have a go. Let's just play it." And I'm like, "We don't need to play it. Like, I've seen how it works. Like, this is rubbish." And she's like, "Well, let's just have a go. Let's just have a go. Let's just try and play it." And did, you have, did you play with them? We did play one, and she was like, "Oh," she said, "What do you reckon?" And I was just like, "I don't know. It doesn't matter." Like, I was like, "Oh," it was like, "How would you prefer to be asked out?" And I was like, "Text message," and she was like, "Oh yeah." 
I actually know it was email. I was like, all right, whatever. Like, it's <laughs> mad. I don't care. I really want to watch this. Now. Um, I can't wait. I mean, I kind of, I felt really bad though because I tried to be, I realised that I was basically just savaging them. So I started to say, oh, well, look, you can actually fix this. What you need to do is just change this rule. So it's the points are based on mm. their personal choice, not based on that. And they go, oh, it's too late. We've already made it now. And I'm just like, why are you talking to me? I'm just going, well, good luck. <laughs> it's just like, this is terrible. Oh, God. Matt, Matt the question that everyone once answered who wins The Apprentice? I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know anything about it. All I know. Yeah, I'm looking at I'm looking shocked, I know. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't know. Don't watch the All I know is I went long to do that and then I, I, just, I didn't sign an NDA, but I, I assumed that somebody else had signed an NDA. Actually, thank you to, to, to Tim from Big Red Barrel, who invited me along to that, who basically said he'd obviously been asked to put together a uh, get the best people team of board a game group ones. of people who might play board games and so he invited me along and I was thankful for that because even though I had to get up very early in the morning to be it I got to take the piss out of some idiots that's um, always worth getting up early in the oh, morning oh it really is <laughs> if that could just be my job description I'd get up at 6 every morning oh good times um, but yeah hopefully that answers your question and it, it'll be on BBC iPlayer I think if you're in the UK if you're not then you're probably just buggered Unless you use Tunnel Bear or something. People get around that. Yeah, you get around it. It's It's the internet. You can do anything you want, providing you're not being watched. Mm -hmm. And on that note, um, thank you very much for listening. And uh, joined by, yeah, Keza, as ever. Yes, I've got um, come to kotaku.co.uk. It's pretty fun. It's now award winning. Award winning, yeah. Like Daft Souls. We're all award winning, actually. Actually, every single person here is award winning. Aren't we great? Yeah, this year. Um, But yeah, come come along, have a look at the website. It was just our award ceremony. We just gave them to each other. Yeah, pretty much. We're all voted by us as well. Mm. Yeah, it's true. True, one, I know. It's good. And uh, yeah, Brat and uh, Jim of Video Gamer Mm -hmm. won best videos here, which was well deserved. They've done a lot more work than I have. Um, Don't go to Kotaku, go to Video Gamer. Go to Video Gamer as well. Go to both. Do you know what? There's enough internet out there for everyone. <laughs> okay. Oh, what a lovely inclusive message. La, 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 la. <laughs> no, we seriously the world. Really Visit don't go, all the games websites. Don't go to websites. All games media are corrupt. Thank you very much <laughs> for listening. Goodbye. Bye bye.